You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 274. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. How's everybody doing today? Welcome to December, our final month of 2023. Very excited to have some great interviews coming up with cookbook writers and a solo show that I'll be doing for the Christmas holiday. But today is no exception with a fun interview that I had with Lisa Lucas and Debriana Mancini. Lisa and Debriana are television pros who shared their kitchens, hearts, anxieties, and good humor when they broadcast their culinary adventures during the COVID-19 lockdown. In the process, they connected with hundreds of hungry cooks from around the globe and then in turn created their cookbook, which, which we're here to talk about today, called That Time We Ate Our Feelings, 150 Recipes for Comfort Food from the Heart. In this recently released book, Lisa and Debriana share their most beloved dishes, never shared before creations, and top voted dishes by members of the Corona Kitchen community. Today on the podcast, we have a fun interview where we talk about how they created their community, the importance of carving out time for joy, creativity, and cooking, as well as advice for first-time cookbook writers. Before we dive into the show, though, I would like to mention that sometimes I hear traditional publishers getting a bad rap in writing circles that I am part of. I hear people describe publishers as profit-seeking enemies who are out to steal our ideas, or worse yet, our souls. I just want to let you all know that I have loved all of my publishers, I consider them partners in helping me create beautiful books so that I could share my recipes and stories with the world. They employed teams of editors, designers, layout experts, printers, photographers, indexers, marketers, and distributors, and they paid them too. One thing about traditional publishing that I think is amazing is we get to work as cookbook writers, providing the recipes and stories and menus and publishers get to work creating the books. In turn, as writers, we become cookbook concept machines. We get to write and crank out book concepts and manuscripts, and our publishers create the books. If you would like to learn more about this style of publishing called traditional publishing, where you get published without spending your own money to edit, design, or print the book, please head on over to www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash free to learn more. So now without further delay, let's dive into this interview with Lisa Lucas and Debriana Mancini. Hi, Lisa and Debriana. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast. Thank you. <laughs> so excited that you're both here. Why don't we take a, a minute before we get started talking about all the things we want to talk about. Um, have you mm-hmm. both introduced yourself a little bit about who you are and what you do? And Lisa, why don't you give us a start? Okay, sure. Um, I am a writer, producer, actor. Um, I've been in the business for about 27 years. Um, produce a lot of television shows mainly and a lot of documentary features. So going into my first feature, making my first narrative feature film next year. So I've been in that industry for a really long time. Um, and uh, I originally grew up in Southern California. I've been in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico for the last uh, 13 years. Uh, my mom's lived here for 30 years. I love the Southwest. And, um, and you know, uh, I was never, I had a catering company um, in my early years living in New York in my 20s. And that was really like, you know, my my cooking background. But I just come from a big family of cooks. I'm Croatian, American, 100%. And there's just, you know, food is our life, (laughs) basically, (laughs) um, like Debriana. Um, And so, yeah, I mean, you know, we're very kindred spirits in that way. But I'll let Debriana tell you a little bit about it. Yeah, (laughs) Debriana. Hi, I'm Debriana Mancini. I am an actor, writer, producer. 
um, in that order. And um, let's see, uh, I have been cooking for as long as I could stand up. <laughs> I was at my grandmother's knee making pasta from the time I was really small. And um, we always made everything from scratch because we were poor, poor, yeah. poor immigrants here, uh, Italian on both sides. Yeah. Um, and and like Lisa, food is just it's the way we communicate. It's the way we show our love to, for one another. It, I always I have a, a solo show called the Meatball Chronicles. And I always say about that, um, everything that I learned in life that was ever important to me, I learned around a meal. Yep. And, and that still holds true. I think in many yeah. ways, I think if, if we could just all sit down to a meal, so many things would get at least solved. It's so much easier to do it when you're breaking bread. And Perfect. that's, um, I think that it, it, Lisa and I were friends for years and years. We never had enough time to even grab a cup of coffee until COVID hit. And I, I, we met each other over a meal <laughs> where we were at a, an event and, um, we were both kindred spirits about how the food was not good where we were and that's how we became friends and and so this um opportunity that happened during covid which was the silver lining allowed us to explore that um love in the kitchen together and it this is this is kind of what blossomed from that yeah and i think that to think that we're on a podcast about cookbooks, talking to people who write and produce and act and aren't even like in the professional cooking space is really a breath of fresh air because it's it just shows me and as the listeners are going to hear that food impacts a lot of people's lives in a lot of different ways. And writing about it is not restricted to those who are professional cooks and chefs. Oh, I hope people notice that. Hundred yeah. percent. So I, I want to say that off the bat. So let's let's get started and tell everybody like why though food, and how did you all get together in the kitchen? And then of course this cookbook is an off a, off a byproduct of that. Lisa, well, it's a crazy story, uh, Maggie. <laughs> um, in fact, we. I mean, I. I don't think I've ever experienced anything so serendipitous in my life. I mean, it just, we did not plan this. Um, it was during the pandemic and Debriana calls me because we knew we were going to be isolated and, you know, staying, you know, locked down in our own homes. And she's just like, you know, I just kind of want to do something. I'm feeling lonely and weird. And, you know, what if we just, you know, cook together? I could cook one night, you cook another night, we'll live stream it, you watch me cook and vice versa. And we'll just hang out because I miss you and and I this is weird and I I'm uncomfortable and I cooking makes me relax and whatever. I'm like, okay, we'll just do it twice a week. <laughs> and so we invited our friends and family. We did this on Facebook. We we called it Corona Kitchen and we just thought this will just be a fun thing for us and to cope, right? And help other people. And next thing we knew. I mean, we had this some carrot cake went viral after like a month or two, and we got thousands of people following us oh. all over the world. Yeah. We were like, what? Um, and then, um, and then, Debriana, if you want to continue it, we started going every night because it got really hectic at the beginning, right? We, were, we cooked 143 nights in a row, like never stopped. And basically, it was just what, you know, in those days, it was what we could find you know, like, look, I found sugar and I, I actually found a bag of flour. Let's make a cake, you know, and it was just what we had in, in our kitchens because we knew everybody else was in the same boat. We were, you couldn't order food from restaurants. A lot of people were home by themselves, didn't really know how to cook. And, um, and so we were just in that space of, um, of, of teaching and holding, holding space for everybody. We, it, it kind of didn't start out that way, but that's just what evolved from it. So and it was super it, exciting. It was, all, it was all comfort food too. It's like, what's mm -hmm. going to make us feel better? Hey, popcorn for dinner, you know, whatever. And we were all kind of in our pajamas, just, you know, cracking jokes, being ourselves, you know, and I think, and because it was live stream, the people watching could 
connect and talk to us at the same time. And it was just hilarious, you know, of just like what people were talking about or commenting on. And we just laughed so hard and it made us feel good, you know, and I think, and we're still doing it every Monday night. Um, uh, But, you know, I think that, so, so we're like, okay, this is great. This is great. So we've got these several thousand followers. We'll probably, to just you know, laminate a cookbook with a few recipes and hand it out to our members of the group of this, you know, what we didn't know was a micro food community, right? Um, that and and so then um, another serendipitous thing happened where um, a dear friend um, of, of a friend said to me, you know, um, my publisher, he was an author in New York, and he was like, you know, is I heard was looking for a quirky cookbook. And I thought of you guys because your show's so great. Uh, do you want me to make the intro? And we're like, uh, okay, <laughs> sure. So then we had zero expectation, right? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so then we, you know, we we talked to the owner of this um, publishing company, Apollo Publishers in New York, and and we just totally hit it off. And we, and you know, we're ourselves. You know, we're political we're opinionated we're feminist we're like nobody's gonna take cookbook from us and uh <laughs> comfort food who wants that and so um everything's been done we're not chefs we're just home chefs and so um they just loved the idea of course we had to do a major you know proof of concept with we hired a graphic designer and we and then it was like well debriana what do we want to do and we were like okay we're kind of vintage retro like we love old 50s and 40s stuff but then you know we kind of turn it on its head with our the way we are and everything and quirky i guess we are quirky <laughs> quirky duo <laughs> and um and so all of a sudden we're in this position where they go well let's do it and we're oh, like what, what? <laughs> like, what? now we got to write the book are you kidding me <laughs> well and the so- interesting thing was we had already test kitchen without knowing it yeah the whole book yeah. Cause we were, we were posting the recipes. We were, you know, we were cooking them live with everybody, you know, dropping knives and kitchen aids on our head and yeah. cutting ourselves in front of everyone, you know, like, cause we're not professional chefs. We're just home right. chefs. So we had test kitchen the whole book without knowing that we had actually done that. Yeah. And you, a- when you write a cookbook, you have to do that, which my food stylist cousin said you inadvertently did it and you didn't even know. Cause like normally I guess when you write a cookbook, you have to spend a year doing that, you know, pretty much, you know, testing everything, making sure it works, making sure it tastes the best it can be. So then we had the serendipity of having one of our Corona kitchen members. What is, um, or was she's retired now. Um, a food photographer who photographed Jacques Pepin, Julia Child, all the Wim Sonoma books. And she's like, I'll do the photography. And we were like, what? <laughs> Again. Yeah. <laughs> and yes. the other part, and the other part of it too was, okay, we're writers, um, actors, performers. So, you know, we wanted to add, because our whole thing was there are stories, there are family stories and friend stories behind all of these recipes. And we wanted that connection to the short stories, to the cook, to the, to the recipes. And we thought, okay, well, if the publisher doesn't like that, you know, I don't know what to do. We don't just want to write a cookbook with just recipes. And they, they agreed. They didn't want to change us. They're like, let's do it. So we wrote 70,000 words. (laughs) Yeah, you know, but. But I think it's great because a lot of people love to read cookbooks. There may be people that buy this that never even cook out of it, believe it or not. They just want to read it. We have had people tell us, I don't even cook. I just love the short stories. Right. And so we're like, wow, that's really fabulous. Thank you. I equate Uh, this to reading gardening books and looking at all the things (laughs) in gardening books, but never. I do that. Exactly. (laughs) <laughs> it's just very beautiful. It's very inspiring. It's very mm-hmm. fun. It's a it's an inter- source of entertainment and it's good, clean fun. And cookbooks are the perfect space to do this. So for those of you that do like to read cookbooks, there is a lot of stories. There's a lot of text. There's a lot of recipes. It's got a little bit of everything. And the the um, I can't wait to dive in more to reading more of the stories um, because you do get to be yourself in telling these stories and the stories behind the people if they contributed the recipe. Mm-hmm. Um, it looks like you tagged the recipes with the names of the people that had created them. 
I yeah. see Lisa's recipes. I see Debriana's recipes, but then I see this whole smattering of recipes from other people. So, yeah. um, are these family, friends, community members, or just a little bit of everybody? Well, yeah. The, when we were in the middle of the pandemic, uh, nobody was working. Yeah. So we reached out to people that we thought might that we'd want to meet. So we reached out to comedians and um, journalists, and we're like, "Hey, do you want to come on the show and cook something, or watch us cook your favorite food?" And everybody was like, "Sure," because they were home. Yeah. So it was kind of a an unusual it was just an unusual moment in time and history. And so there are recipes from, you know, famous people like Frangela and Hal Sparks. And um, I cooked for Bob Seska because he's Italian. So he wanted me to make rav- ravioli and we just talked and, and cooked. And, um, and then we had a contest for our Corona kitchen members. And because, because this whole idea of what happened was a community. It really was a community. So we wanted the book to reflect that too. And so we had a contest for the Corona Kitchen members to submit recipes and that we would put 10 in the book. So some of them are, are from our members. Nice. Were there then, some com- community <laughs> members that like watched it every single night? Like they just oh, yeah. tuned in night after night after night after mm-hmm. night. And, and then- still do. Yeah, yeah. And when we yeah. were in that 143 day stretch of cooking every other night, went back and forth. I called my sister in a panic. Who, who Holly? Of her, she has a store called Holly's Homegrown. Of course, amazing cook in her own right. And I'm like, Holly, can you do Tuesday nights? We're exhausting. And she's just like, Okay, I'll do Tuesday nights. And so she just, you know, helped give us a break and contributed her amazing food with her. You know, she makes culinary salts and different, you know, culinary things from her herb, fresh herbs and whatever at her store. And so we were like, hey, let's just we're in this together. And so it kind of just felt like, you know, whatever we we had in our fridge, whatever we were feeling we needed emotionally. That's why the title that time we hit our feelings. That's (laughs) what we made. And that's what we would eat. And so it was just an organic progression. I'm sure the people that tuned in and entered the competition were thrilled to think their recipe might be in your cooking. Oh, yeah. 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 And there's a lot of them. Well, some of them are chefs. Some of them are home chefs, just like us. And some of them are just like, you know, I, I cook every night for my family and this is what I make. And, and it's my favorite thing that I make. And I wanted to share it with you. So there's, there's a variety of, of range of people in that in that section of the book. Yeah. So would it be okay if we dove into a few of the recipes and talked about them? Um, because give people a taste for the kinds of things that are in this book, because oh, it yeah. really does run the gamut from uh, things you can eat in the morning to cocktails you can drink any time of day to, I mean, there's really a wide variety of, of food. So um, let's go with uh, Lisa first. I picked out a couple and uh, with your guidance, the one is the Dutch baby. Um, tell us a little bit about that recipe. Maybe if you have any memories from when you actually prepared it oh, live. Yeah. And um, <laughs> what is it about the Dutch baby that made you want to even prepare it that night on camera? Well, and- you know how we all have our tried and true. And I would say, you know, for Debriana and I, every recipe in here that, that are our own individual ones are just the ones we know are crowd pleasers. We <laughs> make them forever. And we know they're tried and true. Right. So, um, I knew immediately that I would do the Dutch baby because this is a thing that my mom made us growing up, um, all the time for like a, like a Sunday weekend breakfast. And, um, you know, my mom is a pretty remarkable woman and I, she's really who the book is dedicated to for me, even though I dedicate it to all my Croatian relatives. <laughs> but, um, but this book was really for my mother, you know, it's kind of a record of just all of the family stuff that I love. And I got that through her. And so there's kind of a story introducing her with the Dutch baby. But anyway, she used to have this cookbook. We had a million cookbooks growing up and it was called um, someone's in the kitchen with Dinah. And it was the, you know, singer, talk show host, Dinah Shore in the 70s. And so she had this thing called Aunt Selma's Pancake. And it's basically a Dutch baby, a puffed pancake that you cook in the oven, almost like a popover-ish uh, thing. Uh, but we 
morphed it over the decades to call it the Nut Trippy. I have no idea. I don't even know where it came from. Um, and so, uh, you know, it was just a thing we made in a cast iron pan. We'd put um, homemade jam on it, um, organic maple syrup, and it always had a squeeze of lemon with the syrup. And then there'd be a little bit of a saltiness to it. So it was like this sweet salt lemony thing. And we just gobbled it up. I mean, it is the best yummy thing and as kids we loved it because it, it puffs up in the oven and you watch it and I made it for my children when they were growing up and you it looks like a baby yeah. it looks like there's a baby in the pan yeah. so it's fun <laughs> you know it's fun and then you eat it and then you eat the baby yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um yeah it's just delicious and you know a great thing when you have people coming over or the holidays or whatever because you can prepare it, it looks beautiful and it tastes just incredible, you know. Yeah. So the winner, you know. Yeah. And how did it go over when you did it uh, live <laughs> on your for your, your show? It's so funny. I mean, people. I mean, I don't know. We have our like super fans that watch every single Everything. episode. We have an archive on YouTube. I think it's four hundred and fifty episodes now. Wow on our Corona kitchen, but, um, and so you can, you could experience it now and <laughs> watch <laughs> Dutch baby if you want. I mean, you know, I think we just, we would laugh because it was like, why am I making breakfast for dinner? Um, just cause you know, we're in lockdown and whatever, but you know, sometimes we do that some, and, it, and it's okay. Yeah. It's okay That's to right. have breakfast for dinner. That's right. Okay. I think I wrote a short story about my sister Bridget, who used we have to make breakfast for in the morning, and she we were like terrorized as kids when she would say, "I want a French pancake," and it, it is actually the Dutch baby. So I I grew up making it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Debriana and I have a lot of connections like that. Like it's so bizarre. We sometimes wear the same color clothes. We have we're both the eldest of um, many sisters. Yeah. Um, you know, we both come from, you know, immigrant family backgrounds. We just, we just have a lot of, a lot of different, you know, similar serendipity things. Yeah. Yes. 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 <laughs> well, big families, that kind of explains the whole food thing too. I mean, mm -hmm. people cooked yeah. out of necessity. They didn't have. Right. If they, if they wanted to feed their family, that's what they had to do. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, all right, Debriana, you're next. So what about the, um, oat risotto? That one kind of appealed to me in terms of something that was, a different, a different grain to use for risotto. So tell us about that recipe. Um, my, uh, I, I don't know even how, how that came, came about, but my friend and I, um, uh, years ago, um, were, we were actually what they, what is now known as dumpster diving. We would go, <laughs> we would go to the, to Whole Foods in those days and they let the, the, it wasn't quite dumpster, but at the end of the day, she had, um, and I write this story in the book, she had made friends with the produce manager and he would give us the vegetables that they were going to throw out and they were always gorgeous. And so we started trying to come up with way, different ways to use them. Um, and one of the things was risotto, which I grew up eating. And um, I don't remember where I read it somewhere in my, you know, always reading food recipes life. Someone had replaced um, rice with oat groats. And it has become my favorite thing to mm -hmm. make risotto with because it has more of a chew. It's got it's more nutritious than than just a rice is. Um, and, and it has that kind of more nutty flavor. Um, and uh, I just love it. It, it co comes up the same way as a risotto. Um, so you do the same thing with adding the broth little at a time and the cheese and all the vegetables. And it was just another way for us to eat all those <laughs> vegetables that we were getting um, from, from the store at that point. And it was super fun. It was a super fun time, even though, you know, it was kind of, it was kind of a, you know, what people would have called dumpster diving, but it yeah. was super fun. I grew up very poor. You know, we yeah. were on food stamps and yeah. we made everything from scratch. Yeah. So I didn't have any fear about saying, you know, right. don't throw those out. <laughs> I'll use them. <laughs> right. And risotto is a perfect thing to use stuff like that in. Yeah, as a foil yeah. for vegetables. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. All right, Lisa, you had another recipe uh, that we wanted to talk a little bit about, and there was a, some individual vegetable pot pies. So another vegetable yeah. dish. Um, um, so the title of this recipe is Everything's Going to Be Okay, Vegetable Pot Pies. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and and the titles of our recipes are kind of funny too of just kind of coping you know strategies but for me I mean I just love pot pies I feel like I'm a connoisseur of pot pies I'm always critiquing them wherever I go like one of the, my favorite places to go in New York is um this British um a uh, little tea place that makes all these British foods. Oh my God, now I'm just forgetting it. Um, tea and Sympathy in New York. And they have the best pot pies ever. Um, and the savory ones and all these things. So my kids are self-proclaimed vegetarians. And I'm not. And I had to raise them. <laughs> and they were they just made the connection between animals and food really quickly I did not put this on them I eat meat so I just respected their wishes and I wanted to make pot pies and I normally make this with chicken um or sausage or something and which you can do and I say that in the book but um so I decided I want to make something fun for them and I came up with this and I love it because um it's fun Uh, especially if you have kids to roll out and make the dough and the pie and you can make, I like making little things on top to make them pretty. Um, But I, what I love about this particular recipe is it's just so damn tasty Mm -hmm. and like the cotton butter and um, I put flax seeds in it. You know, I do all my little funky things I do um, to um, get a really great, high crust, you know, on this basically. And, um, just, you have, you know, sherry in it and the butter and the shallots and, you know, um, the combination of petty pois and mushrooms and, and the, um, all of the herbs. I, it's just a delicious little melange of things. And, um, and they come out so cute. And if you're having a party or something, you can do these in advance. Yep. You can relax as the cook at home if you're having people over. That's really what I like I for the individual ones. But you can also make a big one. Like you can make one big one for, you know, um a couple or, you know, a family, whatever. So you can either do individuals or, you know, a pot a pie sized one. But it's they're just beautiful to look at and the the taste of them is just off the charts. I love I adore it. And the neat thing about the individual is everybody gets the same amount of crust. I think it's always yeah. funny whenever I make it in a pan, like the filling might slide out a little bit from under the crust and you might end up with uh, people like, you know, digging into the crust to get more <laughs> of the crust. Cause that seems oh, to be everybody's thieves. exactly favorite part, but the, making them individually yeah. is a great way to. Oh, yeah. uh, That's a point. really good point. I mean, yes. you know, you, you got your crust hoarders, you yeah. know, for sure. Yes, but yeah, that's it's good, very pretty, and um, nice use of the the vegetables. And what a great thing for your uh, your kids who didn't eat meat to be able to still have pot pies because they are uh, just a classic comfort food and perfect for the um, the show you all were doing and the time that we were in. So that's a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. All right, so something a little bit holiday focused, Debriana. There's a cookie, lemony snicket. There is. I'm a holiday cookie. 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 Yeah. So tell us about your cookie. <laughs> I'm a cookie queen. At Christmas, I probably make, I don't know, 600 to 1,000 cookies. And there's usually, and it, and it's um, like usually 10 to 13 different varieties. So it's not like 1,000 of the same cookie. Um, and I've been doing it for years. And I started it with a, a cookbook, which I'll tell you about later. Um, and I, it, it's just my thing that I do at Christmas. And um, this one came about because I have several friends who are gluten-free and um, this recipe is gluten-free flour. And I I like the gluten-free flours for baking that have um, flours that are more conducive for baking, like not the blends that have chickpea in them, um, but the ones that have more like tapioca and coconut flour. Um, And So this one is a combination of gluten-free flour and almond flour. And um, it's a, it's a riff on Italian ricotta cookies. Um, So they're the little dome cookies that kind of melt in your mouth. And um, the, I, we call it the wannabe Italian lemony snicket story, which is (laughs) the lemony snicket is when um, the movie that we were watching when my husband proposed to me while eating popcorn. (laughs) 
Oh, when so, you want to talk about eating, uh, you know, getting getting someone to fall in love with you through the food, who could resist Ebriana? I mean, I think she could get a lot of people to fall in love with her just because of her food. But um, <laughs> so yes. yeah, that's that that cookie recipe. It's super easy. It um, it's delicious, and I've sometimes um, you know, tucked a, a one of those oversized chocolate chips in the middle and. You can do all kinds of things to to change them up, but it's a super easy recipe. Yeah, looks so delicious. So thank you so much for going into those. I think it's always uh, a fun way to dive into a cookbook rather than just what it's about. Talk about some of the unique recipes and those um, certainly fit the bill. And um, once you all had a really su- successful uh at doing was creating your community and continuing your community. And you really just took a chance. We're just going to meet online to cook. We're going to open it up to the public. But if someone is listening to this and thinking that sounds like so much fun, um, Mm -hmm. but how can I work this in? What should I do? Like what, what would you say to them if creating a community around what they love to cook is something that they might like to do Um, now? Cause we're not in Corona time anymore. Right. We're, we're doing our we're doing our thing again, whatever that is. But maybe there's some things and similarities and things that you uh, really have still embraced, even though we're not. That you could perhaps share with people. I mean, well, I we still cook. I mean, we still do it on Monday nights. Yeah, we still do it. Yeah, I mean, I would say, look, if you want to do this, pick a a friend to do it with that you really love and respect yeah. and um, enjoy being around because. Like for me, uh, honest to God, truth is that Debriana got me cooking again through this experience. And I think we all, you know, get to that place in our life sometimes with the American grind where it's just like, I maxed out, I can't cook anymore. And I uh, rediscovered the joy of this and the calm of cooking by hanging out with her and watching our friendship grow. And, um, laughing and and talking about life and whatever. And I think that that's, you know, when it can be organic and it's not stressful, it's going to flow. And no matter what's going on, you know, we still talk about this every, you know, Monday night, what's on our mind, how you doing today, checking Mm -hmm. in, you know, what are you making, you know, and just like if you'd go over to somebody's house and hang out with a glass of wine while they're cooking, that was the vibe of our whole deal. And it still is. So Mm -hmm. for me, I mean, if I'm if I'm hanging out with somebody I really like who's interesting, you know, I could watch them make anything, you know, yeah. it's, it's a good time. Um, but that's what I would suggest. But I don't know. It worked for us. <laughs> yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Debriana? Because that's a that's a, a great way to look at it. You did mention that you'd have still carved out a night. So you you have a night dedicated to this uh, mm-hmm. show uh, now. And that still seems to be working good. Yeah, that and and I mean, w- w- the way this came together was just a a confluence of history, time, pandemic. It was just in a million years if we wouldn't have done this. I don't think because we were so busy. Right. So so that changed everything, and we were able to stop and figure out to do this and to bring some joy back into our lives. And so. If, I guess if you wanted to start that now where everybody's kind of back to work, um, y- you just pick a time and a date and a person that you love, like Lisa said, to do it with that you that you want to hang out with once a week um, or twice a week, whatever it is you want to do. But um, once a week, I think, is a good you know programming note for for these times now. And the other thing is um, we went from you know, being online for an hour and a half because nobody was working to now saying we, we want to be able to, to keep our time about 30 minutes. Yeah. Um, and you know, something quick, easy, that's not, you know, an involved thing that we can share with each other and, and everybody else that's, that's, um, doable within a half an hour. Yeah. Isn't it amazing that something like this though came out of a time of adversity? <sighs> constantly like we're jaw dropped always yeah 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 Yeah. I mean we we hope you know to evolve this into a tv series now you know that's our kind of our next thing and and just 
I guess I think the thing that just hits me all the time is that life is so unexpected. You know, you think you know what it's going to be for you, and it's just not. <laughs> I mean, I could never, as Debriana said, have expected this to happen. Um, normally because we were so busy, focused on our careers. We could barely find time to hang out together, but we enjoyed each other so much and we had so much in common. And so, yeah, I'm just so glad we did it. I mean, yeah. well, you know, they like, always say luck is the, co- uh, is the combination of opportunity and preparation. And I, in a weird way, the opportunity presented itself and the preparation is something just that we naturally have done our whole lives. We've always been, you know, in an entertainment field and we always cooked and it's, you know, it's in our family genes. Like my family has restaurants on both sides, you know, in Italy and here and Lisa's too. And so it it was just something that evolved out of our DNA without us even, you know, thinking about it. Yeah. And we're storytellers too. You know, we're, we're storytellers. That's what we do either writing or acting or whatever the case may be producing. And, um, and we just have, so many stories. we got a lot of storage, Maggie. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <a lot> of <laughs> um, so it's good. And, you know, and with food, I mean, it's just like it, it multiplies the stories. It does. <laughs> and a lot of times it's stories that other people can relate to because they've either cooked the same thing or they grew up in a similar way, or mm-hmm. there's some sort of an intersection and a place that you can hit people with food that yeah. you can't always do. If you all say we're having a show about making Excel spreadsheets, for example, it'd be like, <laughs> I don't think that that like, you know, even begins to like, you know, but there might be people that would geek out on Excel spreadsheets. I mean, who knows? Yeah. Um, I love when we were, we just had a book signing in, um, on the central coast of California. And my dad has a winery. I grew up in a winemaking family. And he said the nicest thing um, when he introduced us. He loved that this was a record, like in the stories, it's a family record of, you know, these recipes. And, you know, those stories are like, if we don't tell them or we don't put them in print, they're going to get lost. They you will know? get lost. Yes. You know, I'm really proud of that we did that, you know. Yes. So I, already, the, I can barely remember anything. We got to write it down. <laughs> exactly. And if nothing else, then people, everybody that's listening, you all have family stories about food. And right. Yeah. We, I have family stories, Debriana, everybody. Lisa, everybody does. Mm-hmm. And um I I think that letting people in on what we're doing in our kitchens, I think it kind of levels the playing field a little bit. It's like, oh. Mm-hmm. You know, they they seem busy, they're writing, you know, shows, they're acting, they're doing all this stuff. But people are kind of, what wonder what they do in their kitchen. I wonder what's going on in there. It's a very and intimate space. It is a very intimate space. I mean, feeding people is intimate because they're actually consuming what we right. prepare for them and digesting it. I mean, it, it is mm-hmm. very intimate. It mm-hmm. really is. And, and it's also um, kind of like pulling back the curtain. There's a yep. vulnerability there. And the fact that we did it, you know, where you're looking in your kitchen and watching somebody like, oh, wait, they don't know how to crack an egg. You yes. know, <laughs> or whatever. It's kind of, you know, opens it up. But we were just ourselves. We're just ourselves. You know, yeah. we're not we're not trained, but we know that this food is good. That's 100%. What we- Right, right. So what I hope that this show uh, really reveals also is that there's a place for these stories Mm -hmm. to be recorded and to be shared in some kind of, and a book does it in a way that, uh, and YouTube records the the videos of it, Mm -hmm. but um, in something that can be shared with people that you all have never even met through Mm -hmm. the power of a cookbook. Mm-hmm. Um, this print product that we can give as gifts, we can share with people, we can talk about, we can read. Um, people make fun of us stacked up, up beside our bed because we haven't read all the cookbooks that we have. It's just just the way it is. Um, so I did want to touch on one more thing. And you mentioned this, Elisa, in something you said. Um, we do get to points in our lives where we think cooking is drudgery. But what are your thoughts about that? And uh, how do you get yourself to like snap out of that a little bit? <laughs> Snap out of it. Snap out of it, Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? Um, I think that it's about um, carving out time. The balance in life is all about carving out time. We have such, we're so scheduled within an inch of our life. But what I what I glean from this entire process, and I will keep it with me till the rest of my days, is that just 
food and making your own food and whether it's like growing your own food, like we both have gardens, you know, even if you only have a container garden, it's just that whole process of um, knowing where your food comes, going to the farmer's market, um, getting excited about vegetables. And when you tap into that um, and then you take it home and you make something with love and you share it with others, it's just, you know what? I think it, it heals us. It has mm-hmm. the ability to do miraculous things. Um, like Devriana said, you know, you commune with another person, you break bread with another person. We we heal arguments. Um, we listen to each other. We stay connected. You know, we're in crazy times right now in our world and we are losing connection. AI is taking over, you know, whatever. And we need this. And AI do, can't AI can't eat for us. It, maybe right. one day we'll be able to cook for us, but it cannot eat for us. And if we don't want AI to cook for us, we can still retain that privilege of being I mean, able to do this. This is primal. This is it primal. is it's very primal. It's very Human basic. Stuff. Human it's stuff. Human 100%. Stuff. We don't yeah. want to And it's it. storytelling. You pass yeah. your family history. Yeah. Through your through your food. Everybody does it. That you know what I mean? It's like every culture all over the world, we all do that same thing. We all have to eat. So somebody, you have to get the food from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. And there's usually, um, well, there can be machines producing it, but when someone puts their hands, like right. people's real hands on the food and prepares it for you, it is a true gift. And it's a gift we can also give to ourselves is the way I feel that we can give it to ourselves. Mm-hmm. We can right. give it to other people. And it's just an amazing way. Um, I interviewed someone for an, another episode of the podcast and she says she just she like can't go anywhere without like making something to like take to people. Like, or mm-hmm. if it's someone moves in, you know, just sharing some food with them is just, it's primal too. Oh, yes. I know. Yes. It's really like, I always, when I have anybody in my life that has a newborn, yeah, I just make it a ritual to bring over some meals, you know, and they, and you watch the people's face go, Oh my God. Thank you. I know. What I, mean. I know, especially <laughs> when those moms them. realize that this is not like it's portrayed in the advertising oh, yeah. industry. <laughs> totally, totally. No, it's and they're so like, cool. thank you. I mean, they're, they don't even have to say thank you. It's just like that look, like, I can't mm-hmm. believe you showed up with something hot or for me to mm-hmm. heat up and eat while I'm I, taking care of this baby, you know, that's like, it's all consuming in the beginning. I feel like I'm um, the one of the lucky recipients of Debriana's cookie Christmas gifts. Yeah. And she's would do it in a tin sometimes or in a, in a beautiful paper bag thing. And eat. And my kids are like, are Debbie honest cookies here yet? Are Debbie honest cookies here yet? You know? And because like, when you get this, it's like, she just gave you the biggest batch of love yeah. and it's just every bite is a hug. Yeah. And, um, and I just, it impressed me for years when she would do this. And I was just like, God, you know, that is pure love that she's doing. How did she do it? You know yeah. what I mean? I couldn't see, I couldn't see even conceive of doing that. And I'm so happy to be in a different mindset now where, um, where I can do that, you know, yeah. or, I mean, I don't do the same, the same thing, but it's really um, mo- one of the most meaningful gifts you can give somebody is food. I think a food gift is great. I had, a, I asked my friends one day when we were out having coffee, I said, okay, so when you all were growing up, like in your neighborhood, was there someone that brought a food gift to your family for Christmas? And what mm-hmm. did you get? So we started talking about it. Like some family, they would, um, where I was from, this is about central Kentucky. So like these Kentucky hams, slices of ham, people would bring that. But w- my friend Mary said that the same lady every year made these little crocks of some kind of cheese spread mm-hmm. every year. And wow. when and it showed up at the door, the family's like, so and so's cheese spread is here. It's time to like gather around with the crackers and maybe crack open a beer. And they would sit there. And she said it was the best cheese spread. Mm-hmm. She said, I have no idea what was even in it. I don't think I could ever recreate it, but it is a Christmas memory of a food gift that she will never, ever forget. Yeah. 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 That's it's terrific. That's... It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. And this is the time of year when food is such, it's, it's going on, ho- hopefully at some level everywhere. Yeah. Culturally for people, um, this time of year, it just, it just is. And I'm talking about all cultures, people just yep, sharing all cultures. Food. Yep. Um, and, uh, it's, it's such a great thing to do. And you all have certainly given some, um, 
good ideas about things that we can prepare this time of year and share them with mm-hmm. other people. And if you don't want to take it to their house as a gift, invite them to over to your house. My husband mm-hmm. always says the best way to get your house cleaned up is to invite people over it's for supper. Totally <laughs> oh my God, it's so true. <laughs> if you feel like you don't want to clean, but you know you probably should, just like extend an invitation, have people That's do it. it. <laughs> Bam, it gets done. Yeah. Yeah. So he's always funny about that. So um, let's talk a little bit about your all's favorite cookbooks outside of this beautiful one that you have written. And um, Lisa, you mentioned one, but let's talk about that one again, because it had a big influence on your family. Um, Well, there for sure this, there were a couple that my memory, you know, and you also you're talking about food memories. This, our book is also about preserving memories too. you know, connecting to all these things. And I love that. Um, It's like writing a little mini food memoir. But I, of course, the someone's in the kitchen with Dinah by Dinah Shore. But there was also this Anne Marie cookbook. I don't know if you remember that. Um, But it was she was the chef of the Kennedys or something like that for all these presidents. And I remember her wearing a sparkly dress and like having a turkey on the thing with their hair up. And my mom referenced that book all the time. And her name was Anne Marie. That's all I know. Hmm. But, um, but I'll I remember see if I can find it. There were a lot, I could get the cover. I have the cover photo of it, but like, there were just so many things where, you know, your relatives or your mothers or, you know, whoever in your life was cooking that they just reference. You're like, Oh, go, go get the book, you know? Okay. And I, and I remember that one a lot. And, and for my own self, I would say um, definitely, you know, Deborah Madison lives in our in our hometown. So I was in my 20s and I that the Greens restaurant in San Francisco uh-huh. and the Greens cookbook was just seminal for me. I was really starting off on my adult life and um, I just loved everything in there. And I love that you didn't have to have meat if you didn't want to. Yeah, um, it was it was just top top there's a napa cabbage salad slaw in the greens cookbook and Uh, um i think it's got like fresh lemon juice on it maybe some i don't know it's so good i I made it once and my sister's like where did you get this recipe i said i got it from the greens cookbook she's like what cookbook is that and so she had like buy a copy of it but that those things in there were some of them very simple but really delicious and highlighted the beauty of just like fresh napa cabbage yes i loved i just loved gorgeous yep Great. Those so I, those are really good. Okay, Debriana, what about you? Um, it's so funny because um, the the what one of the cookbooks that really influenced me was a cookbook series that you can't get now, and it's called The Pleasures of Cooking, and it came out when I bought um, a Cuisinart, and I think it was when Cuisinarts first came out, and it's there. Um, it's it's like um. It's not a book per se. It's a series of, of booklets. But what I loved about it was everything was all about cooking in the Cuisinart. And <laughs> they had pictures of everything. And I was such a young, I was very young at the time when that happened. And, and so I loved being able to, they had stories in it about the food. It wasn't just um, a, like a little paragraph they were really in depth and they had pictures of everything, no advertisements, just so it was in that magazine style, but it had no advertisements. And I, I love, I bought, I had every single one. There's, I don't know, probably 30 of them that that they printed. And then um, when I was moving across the country, I had like 33 boxes and 32 of them arrived. And the one that didn't come uh, was the one that had those cookbooks in it. (laughs) And I was, panicked because I, I, I was just like, what am I going to do? So I, I was like trying to call the company, you know, in those days it wasn't, there was no email. So I'm calling people, writing people by hand, please, where, where are the cookbooks? And I found somebody that had a set of them and I bought them. And then the box showed up. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. So now you got your backup set. I do. I have a, but that's me. I'm the girl with the plan and the backup plan. Right. Usually the backup plan to the backup plan. So it totally fits my, my, my life in general. So it was totally reflection of that. So there's that cookbook, but it was so funny because when you first asked the first, one of the first cookbooks I thought of was the vegetarian Epicure, which mm-hmm. was the cookbook that inspired Deborah Madison. <laughs> yeah. And that's by Anna Thomas, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Anna Thomas. Okay. And I cooked out of that. I mean, I was vegetarian for 10 years and I cooked out of that book for, yeah. a, uh, for a long time. Yeah. 
Those are great books. And um, if I'll, I'll link to all of them in the show notes. Some of them, of course, are not uh, in print as in you. They're not being printed new, but you, there's many places you can find used cookbooks. I'm kind of preaching yeah. to the choir here. You all listening know that very well. Uh, but uh, so, and some of you may have some of these in your collection. So um, time to haul them out and um, give them an overview. <laughs> Find something okay, good to cook. Maggie, I, I found the Anne Marie cookbook. Um, it's on a thrift book site, um, uh-huh. books.com, and it's called Anne Marie's Personal Cookbook. And her her name is Anne Marie Hust, I think, H U S T E. Uh-huh. And if you look at the cover, she's just ready to go for a nice night of. And dining. she's in a sparkly dress. In a sparkly dress. Holding. Her hair is up. The fire is flaming in the background and it's like two single tapered candles. And she's like, yeah. Oh my <laughs> gosh. So funny. But ma- those recipes are phenomenal. They're great. I mean, like if you have to entertain, it's incredible. And I think she cooked for the Kennedy. Yeah. Sure. yeah. yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll link to that one also. Yep. Good. I'm cooking and I'm, I'm hosting Thanksgiving. We have a big family and they're all coming. And um, I don't think I'll be wearing a sparkly dress. <laughs> I want to like wear something nice, but you know, when you're cooking, like you don't want your sleeves hanging and things. Yeah, yeah. You don't want it to be too hot. I don't like to have to be pushing my sleeves up if I'm cooking. So I'm kind of particular about what I wear when I'm in the kitchen, like doing my thing. Yeah. And, um, so anyway, I don't think it'll be a sparkly dress though. No, I wear the same skirt every year. I've had it for years. I made a, a skirt that is made out of these, um, this fabric that has pumpkins and cornucopias and it's like oh and you wear it every year every thanksgiving that's my outfit oh (laughs) that's a good idea wow that's a good idea i just like aprons you know i think i we i just love like vintage aprons my mother had millions of them and um and so i just wear whatever i'm wearing and then i wear some cute little apron and i cook (laughs) enough yeah (laughs) yeah. <laughs> what a great day. So it'll be, it'll be fun. Now this show, if you all are listening, Thanksgiving has already happened, but we still have to talk about Thanksgiving. And um, mm. so anyway, my favorite holiday it is it's a great holiday. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, um, why don't we tell everybody a little bit how they can connect with you guys online and if they want to tune into your show on Monday nights. Mm-hmm. Well, our Facebook, um, group is called golden goose kitchen it was formerly known as corona kitchen which we are still known as on youtube um and so we we are you can catch us live on those two platforms and interact with us while we're cooking um on monday nights usually monday nights sometimes we go on tuesdays but hey we're the network so we can do what we need to do right (laughs) and um and um we're uh, instagram go ahead lisa and tiktok so on Instagram, we're at the Corona Kitch. Um, on TikTok, we are golden.goose.kitchen. Um, so you can either find us at, at either name, but um, we do, you know, a lot of <laughs> what I'd like to say are comedic videos um, <laughs> <laughs> about food and life and different things. But you know, we're on a book tour right now. Um, we just finished the West Coast. We're going to East Coast in January, Midwest, probably right after that. So hopefully, you know, we'd love to see some people. Yeah. We'll sign yeah. on the East Coast after the first of the year. Um, and we'll have all of that on our website. Um, Golden Goose. W-W-W- yeah, www.goldengoosekitchen.com. Okay. Yep. And they can check there and get dates for the upcoming uh, things that you're going to be doing on the East Coast um, after the holidays. That'd be great. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very good. Yeah. Well, it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you all. And I love how if you had looked back four years ago, five years ago, <laughs> that you would be sitting here having a conversation about a cookbook that you wrote. It's crazy. It it's truly true. shocking, actually. Right, right. <laughs> but then, you know, looking forward for years, I mean, who knows what what will happen, what opportunities oh. are going to present themselves, um, how yeah. this is all going to uh, pan out. But um, the cookbook is a it's really a, it's a fun book. I can't wait to try some of the recipes. I love all the recipe titles and the things that are written in it. So I can't uh, thank I want to thank you all, too, for doing it, because it really does capture in a way that you can share with people. Um, 
what you really love about food and cooking and a lot personally about yourselves and um, just thank you for sharing that with us. Oh, thanks. Thanks for having us. You're thank you, Maggie. And I thank just you. for anybody who wants to do this, I mean, there's nothing standing in your way. You know right. what I mean? If you want to do something like this, just, just try, you know, yeah. you don't, you won't know until you try, you know? Yeah. You know and I think, what? don't you think we sometimes like perfect ourselves into inaction though? Yeah. Yeah. Like we think, well, it is going to be like, you know, but it's, it's not supposed to be, it's just got to be whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And be willing to let it unfold and um, yep. let it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I wish Thank you all you. nothing but the best. Enjoy your time meeting uh, cookbook people. That's always fun. And um, <laughs> Thank, you. Have, Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Maggie. Take Thank care. You. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. Again, all the links can be found in the show notes at www.cookbooklove.co. And if you are interested in writing a cookbook of your own, please check out the free cookbook writing masterclass called How to Get Paid to Write a Cookbook. It is designed specifically for food or nutrition experts. And you can check that out at www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash free. So that's it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green. And until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co.